Ray from Retrotainment Recasts. I solely got Greg G Man Flanagan here tonight. How are you? What's happening, uh, homie? Ah, uh, we don't. Well, our cars haven't exploded, and it's not yet Christmas, so I think we're good. Uh, well, don't mention the C word yet. No, it's, here we are with our Christmas themed episode, We're talking the Lethal Weapon franchise and just play some pop culture, ups and downs of the whole saga. Uh, which one's probably the least watch rewatchable, and which one's the most rewatchable? Um, so, uh, Flanagan, you've been a Joel Silver, Richard Donner guy for a while, I guess. Oh, absolutely, Richard Donner's yeah. he's he's a machine, and he he just pumped out great movie after great movie. Yep. Um, anywhere yeah. from the Goonies to this, like he just, it was just golden era for him, really, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Late eighties, early nineties was just golden. Exactly. So, uh, unfortunately, then he passed away there. Was it two or three years ago? Just about. Um, because I think there was talks that he was going to come back and do a fifth one of these. Yeah. Now they're like, oh, let's have Mel Gibson direct. I'm like, nah. I'm good. Let's not let's not do that. <laughs> I don't want Passion of the Christ Lethal Weapon Edition. No, thank you. Um I mean I mean to be fair, his uh his Apocalypto was brilliant and Braveheart was brilliant. But uh yeah, I there are moments. Yeah. I, I mean I don't I don't particularly want to see him direct one of these. The style would be completely different. Mm-hmm. Be pretty manic. Um so yeah. For those who didn't know, Joel Silver wanted to cash in on his earlier success with forty eight hours. Wanted to have Richard Donner helmet, who we would later work with on Tales from the Crypt. Shane Black, who had worked on Predator and plenty of other movies down the line, and even came up with the title that was Die Hard, uh, helmed the screenplays for these first two movies. And then from that point on, everyone else just kind of just kept making it be a fun junk food <laughs> revival. The, the one thing I will say when you notice when Shane Black was involved, because it was the same kind of film. One and two were fairly similar in right. story-wise. The drug deal gone wrong. Someone he knows involved in it. Very and manic think, dialogue. Very yeah. uh, good cop, bad straightforward. cop. Yeah, good cop, bad cop. Very straightforward. It launched the career of Mel Gibson post-Mad Max and strengthened the career of established character actor uh danny glover who had already been in other movies like the color purple and silverado and it's interesting how uh just this whole thing just kind of just keeps varying like everyone varies on what's the weakest sequel and i'm just kind of like it really depends on your mood now they're just so long <laughs> you're holding up numbers but i mean it is kind of interesting how like they used to be fun as a teen young adult. Now there's times where I'm like, I just can't. It's just too much action. There's just because uh, you know, the the first one still holds up pretty well, I think. And, I literally I only rewatched one and two today. Um, literally finished up two there probably half an hour ago. Yeah, part three um, is like steroid induced. You forget who the real villain is. And it's a shame because Stuart Wilson, he's a big bad guy and other stuff like No Escape, Mask of Zorro, and you see him in that. He's a great bad guy, isn't he? Yeah, and then you're just like, I kind of wish I saw more of this crooked cop uh, gang. They're not on screen all that much. It's too much of you know, Gibson jumping off literally almost to his death and surviving and part four is kind of crazy because there's it's interesting Jay. yeah it's, it's interesting villain for jet lee and uh what do you know cop renee rousseau as lorna cole is you know married to gibson but then I, I think the biggest thing that really sucked the sequels and i know a lot of people like him in his own right but Nowadays, he's just kind of annoying just for the sake of being annoying is probably Joe Pesci's Leo Gads. You're just like... Do you know, do you know what? I have a, a couple of bits wrote down here about them, right? Uh -huh. For number three, I, I literally have Leo Gads steals the show in this one. He's the most memorable character in it <laughs> because he's the most annoying character. There you go. It seems like what? he just has to mouth off at everybody every single minute to where you're like, what is the point again? <laughs> but uh, if you look at a, a lot of his films, even when he was in the likes of Casino and or Goodfellas and stuff, he's real mouthy in everything. Mm -hmm. 
to that kind of way. It's it's just him in general. It's like it's like you know if you cast Ryan Reynolds in something, you don't get a character. You get Ryan Reynolds. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't play a character actor. He just plays himself. You pretty much, and yeah, it's wild. And it works. It kind of works in Goodfellas, and then at the same time, you're just kind of like, I mean, uh, I don't know how the character kind of came to be. If I mean, it's interesting seeing him in an atypical kind of movie, but and I didn't find him really annoying growing up. But then again, I didn't find a lot of annoying characters that are now clearly annoying growing up. So I mean, oh yeah. But I think I think it's the more Leo being so quick talking. Everyone kind of was like, "Oh, I like that. He's the one. He's obviously the the comedy Got to have relief a Jersey, in the movie." Italian guy in here, and then Chris Rock. I don't mind him in this, but at the same time, his character just doesn't have the best comedy to no. where you kind of wish he had. Chris Rock doesn't comedy. have Chris. Chris Rock is kind of funny. His stand up is funny uh, to an extent, but the likes right. of Dogma and stuff where he was much much better because he was used better this role didn't suit him at all essentially it because and it was a long way to go i mean part two or you know had kind of a lot of shady stuff uh with the various villains and you couldn't keep track of them all but you were just i mean everyone remembers that final line you know uh, diplomatic immunity diplomatic immunity yeah has revoked blam yeah. and Part one I was, was just, you know, who can forget, you know, Al Young, who's later plays the terrorist Uli in the Crunch Bar and Die Hard, you know, torturing Gibson and then uh, just Get his neck broke. <laughs> the mad sniper that man, scene that's reinserted. That in the man is the edition. ultimate. That man is the ultimate henchman. Yeah, he totally is. He was Danny Trejo yeah. before it was a thing. And then, I mean, Gary Busey is just so freaky as Mr. Joshua and... Even when He's you get to the though, cringeworthy, hey, we're just gonna duke it out here, even though you're arrested, you know, it's it, it it's it's spe- speedy film. It really moves along really quickly, and in that first one, and as, I think, as I said, I have I have a few bits, I have a few bits wrote down there, and for the first one, I have the fight with Buse. He was relatively poor, um, <laughs> but it was a good ending. I mean, everyone. That's the kind of ending you wanted to see. It's the kind of ending that everyone was expecting in Predator when he, when him and the Predator go one on, uh, one on one. The Predator go one on one. Do I mean, like yeah. they they make out that Mel Gibson is a, a martial arts expert in this, but it really doesn't hold up when he when he's fighting Gary Busey. He apparently he has, yeah, he, did he's study trying to use some that Steven Seagal style. Though. Yeah, everyone was trying Aikido. to do the Aikido, and Aikido is a defensive art. It's not a fighting mm. art like everyone makes it out to be in the movies. And yeah, that's I, that's why I think um, Seagal done it really well because he all you always see him. He never attacks. It's him defensive mm-hmm. attacking. If you know what I mean, he's counter fighting. Uh, that, um, like, and... was, it's hard to like someone like Seagal when he's the guy being the instigator to where you're like, kill Seagal. Oh, wait, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> but um, no, that's like it, number one is really enjoyable. Um, And I would say I'm going to go out on a bold one here. And I'm going to say this is a better franchise than Die Hard is. Ooh, I dig Die Hard more than this, but they, fair enough. They, they, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. From me... This is a better franchise. It's a stronger franchise than Die Hard. What about 48 Hours? Is that a better franchise than this? <laughs> it's just two movies. You know what? You know what? I haven't seen 48 Hours in probably 10 or 11 years, so I don't I, really overly remember it. I think that's the one with Nick Nolte, isn't it? Yeah, and Eddie Murphy. And I, yeah. I, I just liked how, you know, I growing up, I hated the sequel. Then I've come to love it even more in recently just because it was just so straightforward. We're going to do the same thing again. And then we're going to end the fight the same way again. And we're going to play to the camera noting, hey, you came here to see the same thing. So here's the same movie, except <laughs> now we're fighting the bad guys from the first movie's brother and his gang. And one of the Which cops Die went on to do. <laughs> yeah, Die Hard went and did some of that. I, I think that's just it. Just Simon Grubber and the hacking in part four just did it for me. Uh, part two and five, of course, are pretty weak. Uh, I just overall just respect what Die Hard's done with just all the various hostage scenarios and one-liners and badass so, villain writing for cinema. For me, Die Hard One is is 
obviously perfection. the best of them, and and three is the second best. Mm-hmm. The rest of them are relatively weak. Well, that's just it. I mean, they just can't compete. And, and as much as I like Jeremy Irons, even he, you know, he just can't yeah, beat no, Alan it Rickman. Just... It was just done way too well the first time, and I think it's just that the main issue I think that franchise ca- had a problem with is it just spent so much time just in between each sequel. Like it had to happen like every six years and you're like, really? <laughs> yeah. They, like that's why I'd say this one's a better franchise because one, two, and to an extent three are all relatively strong. They were all basically every six years like all throughout the 80s and 90s <laughs> what was Actually, it 87 no. eight no wasn't so, it was it 80, two, two to four 80, years my bad <laughs> yeah. yeah um but that's what i mean like this is an overall stronger franchise mm-hmm. um, i guess in my opinion um, i mean because i guess it's just the last four repetitive. nine have been dreadful <laughs> well die hard's pretty repetitive one and two are the exact same <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's why I don't four, like part two. It doesn't. Four, it, four goes to Russia. Is four the one in Russia? No, no. Part five is the one in Russia. Part four oh, is the one with the computer hacking and killing a helicopter with a car. So yeah, that one. Yeah, no. Five was just horrendous. <laughs> oh, so bad. I I watched it once and I swore I'd never watch it again. But, I guess I just uh, loved all the car porn that was in there. I'll take it over <laughs> Fast and Furious. I think the main I'll issue, just, though... I'll was, just watch Gone in 60 Seconds for that. Oh, God. Well, there you yeah. go. I mean, the main deal with buddy movies is now they've kind of forgotten even the Die Hard Lethal Weapon or 48 Hours mentality. Now they just kind of go for, hey, let's be like the knockoff franchises, Bad Boys and Rush Hours. I'm like, well... I mean, Absolutely. Rush, Rush Hour is kind of funny. But I would For a while. Out. I wouldn't say it's Jackie Chan's best movie. And then Bad Boys, you know, you can enjoy it as a Will Smith actioner, but it's, you know, it, it's it's not Beverly Hills Cop. And that's a shame because nope. Beverly Hills Cop's another one where it's like the first one was just too good. And second one was okay. And then part three was pretty lame. <laughs> You're just like, Disney. I like part three. Part three is fun. It was a guilty pleasure of me growing up, but I can understand now how it's kind of bland outside of the Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Like, yeah, as you said there, like, that was the movie that I originally suggested we do for this one, but you'd already done it, which was a shame. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, we, I, we covered all the Eddie Murphy buddy movies, and, and we were kept joking that Metro is an unofficial Beverly Hills Cop sequel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting a new one of them as well this year, aren't we? Or next year? I, sometime this year, we're just hoping everyone's up to the... You know. Well, all three. I seen. I seen a photo of all three of them on set. So, I imagine it's gonna be horrendously bad, though. Yeah, it could easily be a lesser. I mean, it's kind of like with the you know post expendables guys. You know, they've been trying to do a bunch of projects, and some of them are just making you wish you just rewatched your classic '80s and '90s movies instead of them doing something new. And at the same time, you do oh. want them to do something new, even though they're just they're just getting up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stallone, I think Stallone's new one, Samaritan, was quite good. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people bash that one, and it seems like, I don't know, I don't know what they really expected. It was, it, you know, him trying to do something different instead of the billion franchise sequel, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And you've got to commend them at his age to try and rebrand themselves again, Um, where some people won't. Um, And like, what I liked about this obviously Mad Max blew Mel Gibson into the stratosphere mm-hmm. for a for a stage, and then he reinvented himself going in as a cop, and then he reinvented himself as William Wallace, You're right? And then he re and then he reinvented himself as an absolute wanker. <laughs> but, it seems like everyone had an ugly brush just with reality after a while, and it just like it just made you wonder, like. Were they always that way, or did yeah, did money spoil them and they just became a absolute dickhead? You know, because racism doesn't happen overnight. And at the same time, like it, his personal life was pretty relatively quiet compared to most people, and then that just blew up. And then you're just like, man, don't get close to your heroes at all. It's just uh, absolutely. And like the amazing thing is, you look at the likes of Mel Gibson and some of the statements he's came out with slander in certain races 
yeah. but has acted alongside the likes of Danny Glover and things. Right. And like he cast, he cast, or sorry, he shot Apocalypto, which was all nearly native and Southern Americans and, and stuff. And like mm-hmm. how how you can come out with certain statements like that is is beyond me. Well, and then I'm surprised he hasn't been like some of these other infamous people where they do the whole I have a black friend as if that shields me from <laughs> what awful shit I've said. And and uh, you know, just, and then just you shy had, of coming out with uh, I'm not racist. I have a colored TV. That's all they're short to say in these days. Yeah, pretty much. Or I served in Nam. I'll pull the Patriot card. I'll pull the religion card. It just seems yeah. like I don't know. Bollocks. It's bollocks, and at the same time, it's just like I mean, it was kind of like how we just all had kind of a coming to Jesus moment with Bruce Willis. We thought, okay, he's just phoning it in. It's like no, he had dementia this whole time, and studios took advantage of that, turning all these half-assed movies with him. And Arnold, you know, he's mm-hmm. getting up there. He's more busy on Twitter than he is doing movies. So it's kind of like everyone's just kind of a little past their prime now, which is. It's just sad. Bruce doesn't have dementia. Bruce has asphyxia. Okay, well, so there you go. But he had some, yeah. yeah that's yeah, he was um, having trouble remembering lines, and they were fed to him manually for like a headset. It's like that's just sad. And that yeah, studio that was time. behind. Them. Well, but like the studio guys, uh, Emmett Furlow, were apparently taking advantage of him. So that's why they're like churning like you know more movies at them each year than Eric Roberts. You know. <laughs> She's there. Uh, he, he must have had about twenty movies a year. Yeah, just about. I, like, I didn't like, mind some of them at first, and then after a while, it's like, oof, this is, <laughs> this is really bad. <laughs> I remember, I remember the beginning of the end came in that one, the cold light of day. Oh, the one with Henry Cavill. Yeah, it was bad. Sig- and Sigourney Weaver. Yeah, it was. It was pretty bad. Um, I think Hostage is probably one of his last good ones. That sixteen blocks and tears of the sun. Oh yeah, sixteen blocks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, it's it, everyone come. It all comes to an end at some stage for people. Well, it sucks. Is just then when you just can't keep up with their material. It's like, so do you just remember the good times, or do you just say they're critic proof because they've done so much good? Now they can do a bunch of shit. Now it's almost uh, like. That's what everyone seems to do half the time. Do you want to become known for being in bad movies and being the best, uh, the bright bad spot in all of them? Person. Yeah, the bad, the B movie person, or do you want to be the good movie person who then just fell from grace post nineties? You know, it just seems like after a while. I mean, and people also forget, you know, before the internet was a thing, you know, people already kind of had trouble just kind of keeping up with various things. You know, we. We weren't always privy to reviews. We would go to video stores and say, hey, I've never heard of this movie before. I guess I'll check it out. And the next thing you know, it's like, oh, I've never heard of it because it was a festival release or it was a made-for-TV director video shit fest. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's what we used to do. So me and my best mate, when we were growing up, we used to work in a video shop, but we used to go over and used to be able to rent out the DVDs. And it used to be five five DVDs for five nights for a fiver. Oh, right? wow. And we'd go in that's and find deal. You'd go in and find the worst looking cases you could find, or the worst looking, <laughs> you know, the synopsis on the back, and see if we could get a good one out of it. <laughs> and I watched some amount of trash. I'll tell you that. I bet. Found a couple of good. Found a couple of good ones in there, mind you, but um, absolute trash. <laughs> a lot of them. And and so severely enough, a lot of them had the likes of Bruce Willis and stuff name on it. And he might be in it for about five minutes. Yeah, it's a Danny Trejo effect. But here's the thing. Yeah. We're just harder on someone who used to be the lead when now all of a sudden they're the supporting. And it's like I used to get on it with other people before they even started doing movies of that like when I would see someone like uh, Anthony Hopkins or just some other beloved actor. I'm like, ah, why were you in this? You fooled me. And it's like and it's before we realize it's like it really is that easy to do it's just be in it and you're paid just 20 million for literally a day it's like yeah it's absolutely why it's, wouldn't you <laughs> yeah it's just a shame that half the time like they'll be they would be in movies where actors clearly weren't on their same wavelength or just filmmakers were just being rushed and apparently this absolutely. Emmett Furla guy the reason they took advantage of Willis and Stallone and 
even De Niro, 50 Cent, all, Vaughn Kilmer's, like they just, they're just trying to get with just all kinds of markets and making them dirt cheap. And apparently it's just r- ridiculous how there's been a report on how they were promising all these actresses roles and next thing you know, they didn't get the roles. So they're talking about all this scam and there's actually no one to run their studio. They've had to actually close it down and file chapter 11. I'm like, that's ridiculous. That's how cheap they are. Uh, in these kind of days and age, you can't be promising things that you can't deliver because you know you're going to get sued. There's that, and eventually it will all come crumbling down. If you just aren't going to stay true to your word, then just don't make the movie. Um, Absolutely, but do you know what I mean? Like, if you promise, say, this person, that person, that person, they sign a contract to do something for you, and you decide, oh, I'm not using them, <laughs> uh, you, you know shit's going to happen, and you're going to give away money for free, and then that's not going to help. No, that's and it doesn't yeah, help you, that the movies they away. were churning out were trash, right? It was like, and they they just had been fortunate enough to be like part of multi produced films like Street Kings and Lone Survivor, and so they could hide behind that from the producer of this. Um, what's also annoying is uh, Richard Donner was just such a cool influence with these buddy movies he kind of just blended in to the rest of his resume he was always on predictable and uh he had one a big of them directors, with silver it was one of them directors you wouldn't know what he was going to come out with mm-hmm. so obviously like you had the goonies which was obviously another buddy type movie but to go from that to the likes of um Little weapon and stuff was such a big change. Mm-hmm. Do you know that kind of way? Yeah, totally. But um, I think he was he's a fabulous director. Yeah, um, and it's a shame that he and Joel Silver kind of had a falling out. Like Joel Silver was like claiming him as like a dependent on his taxes or some shit, and Donner was like, "Hey, man, after being <laughs> friends for with you for this long you know you don't get to treat me that way and i think he just kind of just left the spotlight after a while other than 16 blocks yeah. which is you know connected to those de- guys it was decent it was good and that's where those crappy producers got a hold of bruce willis and started taking advantage of him but <laughs> uh what's annoying is how i uh, just is so ingrained in every kind of movie, even when it's not meant to be over the top and deliberately unrealistic. I think that's kind of also Lethal Weapon sequels eventual problem. Like if you know they would see an explosion, doesn't happen in real life, but they just would joke at the camera, see, we want you to laugh. Here, here's you know, we're a crowd blazer. And it's like after a while they kind of do it to where it's like, okay, you're deliberately cartoonish and you're just too much for your own good. <laughs> yeah, well four four was exceptionally that kind of way where everything was just thrown at you for no reason. You have a great opening with a guy who's an armored bank robber. He's got a flamethrower. And then, you know, I just can't top that after a while. It's just like endless, like, uh, Mel Gibson getting in wrestling matches with Jet Li's men and Danny Glover getting the piss kicked out of him. It's like, okay, well, it's just excessive. I'm, and using the same thing, I'm getting too old for this shit. Yeah. It's like, it was funny the first time. I don't need to hear it again. And to be fair, like he's talking about retiring in the fourth one, and he's still going in in the fourth one. And you're like, mm-hmm. he was a year away from retirement, according to him. In in part two, when they're going into the house, and then three and four come out, and you're like, what the fuck is going on? And the man's house gets blown up twice, and yeah. the car runs through the window. <laughs> Uh, yeah the highway chase is really great and at the same time you're just like take these out the movie's barely even 20 minutes like there's just not much substance and then you had you obviously had the chase scene in the first one where will or where mel gibson is running after the car which is repeated in bad boys i i bet <laughs> they were stealing from other uh i would like I wouldn't say to me like I seen it. I seen a thing there on one of the Facebook horror pages that I'm in for my other show um, on the slab, which is the horror show that we have. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> it was it was saying that I mean, like I don't know what you, do you watch horror films? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't prejudice so, against any 
uh, genre, unless it's just so like you know, kind of subgenre you know, I don't like. <laughs> you know, Ty West, his mm-hmm. new movie, Pearl. Yep. There's a scene in that where Mia Goth is standing in front of a scarecrow, and it's a scene for scene from Wizard of Oz. And people are like, he's stealing from the Wizard of Oz. And he's like, he's not stealing from it's anything. It's a homage, if anything. But it's yeah. not. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's different if Wizard of Oz was a horror movie and you're bringing it into that. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's great to, to see these kind of things. It's meant to maybe even amusing, you know? It's just, and that's different from, say, Brian De Palma, who's made a career of taking shots from Alfred Hitchcock and trying to make it his own because he loves Hitchcock that much. That's how he based his career on it. And then... I, if there's anyone who's a still, it's definitely J.J. Abrams. You know, he literally will take scenes from a movie and add nothing to it, and you're like, "That's I'm cool." Not entirely, I'm not. A, I'm not a big fan of Abrams anyway. No, it's it's bad, and I see some defend him, and they don't understand it, and I see others who hate him, and I, I fall on the latter because, like you say, he's just. I mean, you look at Mission Impossible Free. I'm like, you took that scene from True Lies. Absolutely. You didn't, you didn't add anything said to that, that. I said that to someone and they were like, no. And I was they like, go and watch it. True Lies. I was like, go watch True Lies and come back and tell me that that's not a robbery. It's a total robbery. I'll, 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 get a, I'll get a text message a, a week or two later and be like, yeah, you were right. Fucking and right, I was right. Right. And don't uh, be like, oh, it's so original. Oh, it's so much fun. You know, when, you know, they introduced this rabbit's foot and I, I will commend all the Lethal Weapon movies for not introducing villains that get away and aren't addressed in the next sequel. Is like Mission Impossible Free did that, and they're like, hey, you got to go after this gadget called the Rabbit's Foot. And at the end of the day, oh, what's it mean? I I don't know. I'm like, well, why did you waste time? It was like time? they ran out of ideas. <laughs> yeah, they never had an idea. They're just not inspired. And then, you know, you see his fan film versions of the new Star Wars and Star Trek movies, and you're just like, did you just want to just show shit blowing up in space? That's all you did. <laughs> pretty much. Absolutely. Pretty much. But um, yeah, like there's certain things that you see, like th- obviously this was the a- early mid eighties when the first one came out and then you see it being repeated in bad boys in 97. Right. See Bruckheimer's it, see trying to other do movies. Well, and, bad boys as well because it's like Bruckheimer wants another Beverly Hills cop but he's still going to the lethal weapon playbook of having a very evil villain in. I'll tell you what though um, Fouché in bad boys was an unreal villain Fouché in, yeah in, in terms of like he's so classy in the way he does everything right up till the end oh you're talking Jet Li's character or are you talking no, no, in Bad Boys, um, the way he went back to, like, yeah, I, Fouché, I, I yeah. Who's Fouché? Sorry, I'm, I, I know the actor. I don't know the character name. <laughs> oh yeah, he's the he's the main bad guy. He's the French bad guy in Bad Boys. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. Um, okay. I can't think. I can't think of his name, his actual name, but it was the fellow with the beard. But like that was a top class bad boy or a top class um, villain. Um, even when you look at this, Gary Busey's character was obviously the muscle in this. Um, was a very, very good bad guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, as Jonah, and because like he's taking out the trash himself, he's just hiring literally a guy in a copter to just transport him, and he is just sniping all his guys, setting up bombs, and that's what he's like. The, it's so funny when they deal with a bomb in part two and it's a toilet bomb, but you know, it doesn't have <laughs> the same impact as they're going to the witness's house. They don't find the witness here. They're like, must have gotten to him first. He must be gone. And next thing you know, it blows up right behind him. And they have that legit funny reaction like, oh shit. <laughs> and then they're talking to the kids. I seen the guy. He had he had a drawing on his arm. He's like, it's that tattoo. Of course it is. Mel Gibson doesn't have his jacket on and he has no tattoo anyway. He doesn't mention it. Mm-hmm. And then the kid's like, oh, has that tattoo? The Special Forces one? And you're like, oh, really? There's some, like, I understand it's the 80s and there's, you have certain 80s cheese to it. Oh, totally. some, of, some of them take it a little bit too far. Oh, totally. And but now we know it's also. Enjoyable. Yeah, well, and it's kind of just of a dying breed. You know, this was like one of the ones that gunned it and then at the end of the day kind of just uh 
from that point on, like every movie was trying to outdo it and they just couldn't top it because they didn't have the same kind of crew, the same kind of atmosphere, the same kind of talent. You know? The fourth one, the fourth one it is is very dark. It is Obviously, dark. It starts off. It starts off with the suicide. Yeah, you're like, whoa, um, whoa, what's going on? Going on? Half naked gal just committed suicide, and then, and the special edition kind of just helped because it adds in all the stuff, and it's often used for now the TV edits. Now where it's like, uh, Riggs's first scene is literally stopping, a uh, sniper who's like taking a building hostage, and you're like, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen the extended versions. Um. I must check them out. Often they're they're often the one that's now often on DVD or Blu-ray. So I know. I haven't. I haven't. I have the forties from probably when four came out. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Yeah, they but, were a later um, thing in like the late nineties, early two thousands. So. <laughs> yeah, because I know certain companies are bringing back the older eighties and nineties movies now. Um, I'm bringing them out in like 4K with with the extended editions and stuff. Like I've I've seen a lot of the horror ones coming out mm-hmm. with them, so I'm I'm hoping a lot of the 80s action comes back to like some Rambo and stuff. Oh, totally. But um, I wouldn't mind like seeing the extended version of these to drop in a bit more. Like it's an hour and 40 minutes. The first one, an hour and 47 or something, and it moves relatively quickly. Um, from point to point, the second one I think is an hour and fifty or something. They're all in and around that. Um, it's not like they tried to drag them on either. Gotcha. Well, and it's interesting to bring up Rambo. That's another one where, it's like those first three movies, I adore, and then it's like they get even more gruesome, and you're like, but it's still just too cartoonish, and you're just like. Yeah. It, it's like after a while, everyone kind of forgets the tone. They just get so self-absorbed. I mean, Terminator is another one where after a while, it's. I mean, I actually like the last one because it's trying to be like the first two. The other ones were trying to do too many loose ideas, and at the same time, trying to have a bunch of chase scenes. That was like, well, you're not going to one up T two, so I don't know why you're trying. <laughs> it's just yeah. Um, I haven't seen anything past uh, T three. Uh, I wouldn't watch Salvation because they changed to Christian Bale. <laughs> uh, and then I just gave up then. I was like, nah. The TV show was great, surprisingly. But I think that's just it. It's like after a while, some stuff needs to be left untouched. There's a lot of great Terminator comics, for instance. It's just like some stuff should just exist in a different medium. <laughs> uh, well, like one and two, they should have stopped there and done. And that yeah. was it. James Cameron should have stopped there and just said, they're my characters. Simple as that. We're done. Yeah. Easier said than done if you don't own the property. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, he do- I think he does own the the, char- the Terminator character, does he not? No. It's, it's a multi-deal. Like, Lionsgate and uh, MGM own those earlier movies, and then the other ones were owned by, were sold off to Warner Brothers and Sony overseas, so... Oh, I thought I thought I read somewhere that Cameron owned the the actual the rights to the the character itself. I I doubt it. Uh, they wouldn't have made so much money. <laughs> well, it's that too. I mean, you're gonna but, get uh, a credit for it, but they can if the studio owns your property, they can make as many sequels as they want to it without your permission. Oh yeah, like but that's why I always thought he he held on and held on. That's why there was only two, and then obviously three came out in early two thousands was because he went back and said, right, well, you can fire away with another one. Yeah, no, I could be wrong a, with that. It's a shame because he had the ending set up perfectly. Now, fortunately, you know, with Lethal Weapon, I think what sets it apart from other franchises, it is literally the same crew, same second unit, a lot of the same camera and gaffers. Yeah. And, uh, I love that, though. Different, like, but they kept They kept true to the originals. Um, in terms of thing, I like that where they keep like I understand the likes of Beverly Hills Cop couldn't do it because obviously the first one's in Detroit and then it goes to Beverly Hills, yeah. And then the second one they're elsewhere, so there's obviously going to be different characters, but a lot of the mains were the same, pretty much. And don't get me wrong, the new additions aren't bad. I Renee Rousseau added a lot to it. It was just I think the main issue was just like 
Leo, they just want to just make him be just too over the top for his own good. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? The the scene in number three, you know, when uh, they're they're in the in the building in the warehouse, and she's fighting the lads, and Riggs and Marta Marta's like, "Come on, we go help her." There's five of them. He's like, "No, just watch this," and she <laughs> kicks lumps out of the five lads. He's like, "That's my girl." <laughs> right. Like it, she was extremely over the top in the first one. As Lorna Cole, um, yeah, and, and was relatively four, quieter in the second one. and does like maybe one yeah. or two punches, but yeah, well, she's pregnant as well, and it, yeah, but like it was such a random one. Like, obviously, they kill off the love interest in the second one, and part um, four was by the writers who worked on martial law, and Jonathan Lincoln had written Showdown Low Tokyo. No, everyone just couldn't resist doing the East meets West. <laughs> Had to be, didn't it? it? Like when I say, I remember when I first seen it, and I was like, "Oh, Jet Li's and this is gonna be awesome." And then I was like, "No way, this isn't going to be awesome." <laughs> I was like, "I was like, why?" I was like, "None of these lads can stand up." And I know they used the Mel Gibson was a martial artist, but like Jet Li is a legitimate badass martial artist. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know whether you've seen Kiss of the Dragon. And things oh, like that. of course, yeah. I've seen all his big hits growing up. It's a shame that yeah. he's had to retire. He's got arthritis. It's like, oh, he's in a bad way, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Which is a shame. Like he was never a great artist. He's like Jackie Chan. He just kind of there. And some of the movies were fun to watch, and then it was taken over by the likes of Jason Statham and stuff. Yeah, Statham was another one who, much like some of these other actors, I was just hit and miss on. I would find him cool and otherwise lame piece of shit. And other times I'd be like, hey, he is the transporter. So he's going to always kind of play to that factor. Basan helped him out on that one. And he'll often, he's got at least three movies that I can safely say are definitely action classics, especially with Safe and Homefront. Um, That's the one that I was, I was waiting. I was going to say, there's one really, really good one that I enjoyed with him in it. It was Homefront. Yeah. It's the one yep. uh, with his daughter. That was brilliant. That's probably that. And there was one at the start where he's in his apartment. I can't remember the name of it. He's in his apartment and he comes out and there's a gang outside. And he's like, do you ever hear of Hurley? It's an Irish game. It's a cross between hockey and murder. And he beats the lads to a pulp with a, with a, with a hurl. Mm-hmm. That, like, I can't remember what one it was. I think it might've been the mechanic. Yeah, the mechanic. No, no, the mechanic, the mechanic he's rich, isn't he? That's uh, the one he's the hitman. Yeah, he's hit hitman, yeah. No, he's he's a cop in this one. Um, which doesn't narrow it down very much either. Uh you're probably thinking of war with Jet Li. He's an FBI agent. No, no, Jet Li was Jet Li wasn't in this one. Um it's just another one with, with Stadium that I thought was decent. Oh, probably Blitz, where he's going after a serial killer. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like he took over that mantle of martial artist. He did. Uh, although I would gotta say it's ridiculous how it took this long for him to say, "Hey, let's pass on the Expendables franchise to him." Like, well, yeah, no shit. It should have been his thing after like by movie two because it was very clear behind the scenes that all the other guys just wanted to do cameos. They didn't want to be in the movie and. They killed themselves almost every time while doing it to where it was like, you know, just don't don't overdo it, guys. Let's, let's yeah. have fun. I, it was good. And then like, obviously they, it was a strange one. They brought Liam Hemsworth in um, to three and killed him off quite quickly. Yeah, it's like they're making fun of all the young guys who could be girly men and have an athletic appeal. And then, yeah, they just keep goofing around with it. <laughs> it was a strange, like... um. I'm glad, like, obviously it sounds bad that Donner has passed away, but that they might not go back to do another one of these now to drag it through the dirt again. Yeah, I think audiences are done with it too. It just would be too much. They don't want to keep doing this, you know, to where, again, it just does itself in. You want to actually... Leave it with respectability. (laughs) Yeah, and you... After a while, you got to just say, "Hey, guys, let's let's just chill." Absolutely. Like, I'd put I'd put the first one of these up there as one of the best Christmas movies. 
it is a good Christmas movie and everyone often overlooks it just because the Christmas tree is only in one shot, but you can tell. <laughs> it's Well, it's around Christmas because uh, the ending of it's towards New Year's. And like the oh, reference right. that it's coming close to Christmas. Mm-hmm. So it's a Christmas movie. You know what I mean? Like you get that usual yeah. conversation. Why can't it be a Christmas movie? Because it's an action movie. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Right. If it's set at Christmas, it is it is what it is. Yeah. They, no, like no. that's the argument you get, you know, where people are like, oh, Die Hard's not a Christmas movie. The whole story of Die Hard does not work if it's not Christmas. Of course, it's a Christmas movie. Yeah. I mean, the whole point was he tries to make it up to his, you know, estranged wife and at a Christmas party. It's. But like the, the, all the people wouldn't have been on that floor to let the building be taken if it wasn't for a Christmas party. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It, I, it's those, those arguments. It can't be a Christmas movie because it's an action movie. No, it's a Christmas movie. Simple as that. Same as this. Mm-hmm. You would think everyone just hasn't figured out by now. <laughs> but for sure. Sometimes they everyone are very... needs to be reminded. They're very fun to go back and rewatch. Like I hadn't rewatched these in a in a while. I know we were due to do it a while back, um, yeah. and obviously things came up and stuff. Um, so I held it closer to when I knew we were going to do it. No, it's all good. It was and great. It was it was great to go back and rewatch them. Whatever you got to do to keep it fresh, uh, I applauded for that. But it's, I mean, to further on your point, I think it will always be just kind of the untouchable quadrilogy. Is just because. It is for the most part. Yeah. As much shit as I give the last two sequels, there's still you still got to see them. There's still some good that overall outlines. Oh, yeah. They're they're three out of five movies. They're five Absolutely. star movies versus the first two, which are at least you know four out of five. Four and five, a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'd say I, I I'd nearly put the first one as probably four and a half, five out of five. So there you go. Yeah, it's the first one is definitely a classic, if not a Christmas classic. It is definitely a movie that we will always reference in some way because, again, it was fresh, it was ripe, it was perfect mm. for audiences to consume. And it's just kind of a, a shame that people still struggle to kind of come out with a buddy movie. At the end of the day, they're often just forgettable or they're funny, but they're not that great on rewatches. It seems like everyone just has trouble redoing this formula. It's just too good. Or there's a, um, or it's an indirect knockoff of something that we've seen. Yeah. Which isn't bad if you have a good story. If you have but a good story, but yeah. If you don't, if you don't, if you can't write the story well, there's no point in doing it because you're only going to be remembered. You might grab a few pounds quickly off it, but it'll it'll fall. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it happen. Like that's what Bad Boys, I think. That's where Bad Boys One and Two came in and and survived quite well because it was a good action movie. Right. But you get other ones that come out, uh, cop out with, which oh. was Kevin Smith's um, one with Bruce Willis. That was bad. It was poor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's loads of them that have come out over the years, and you're like, oh, like even for instance, Turner and Hooch was half decent. Or sorry, not Turner and Hooch. Uh, Tango and Cash was another yeah, buddy one. Those are fun as long as you don't think about them too hard. Uh, Two Guns recently, I thought was a lot of fun, but uh, there's... that was uh, that's that's all that was, and you'd expect a lot more because Mark Wahlberg's a decent actor. He he's again like I said about Ryan Reynolds or something. When you cast Mark Wahlberg, you cast Mark Wahlberg. You don't cast the character. Yeah. You get the same thing over and over again. Well, I, I and just, you have, obviously, you have Denzel then. Yeah, I, I just dug out. It was just kind of quick and to the point. And you had a what fun movie? villain in the form of Bill Paxton. But yeah, there's there's other movies, though, like The Heat, that are just unbearable. And Speed's kind of well, a funny any, movie. Anything, anything that has Melissa McCarthy is not funny. <laughs> Fair enough. She is really just not funny. But if you want a two good Sandra Bullock buddy classics, you you got to see Demolition Man and Speed. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Demolition yeah. Man is far ahead of its time and so overlooked. Mm-hmm. And it's like everyone um, just gets so stuck up on Wesley it. Snipes. Like, absolutely steals the show in that. Wesley Snipes has even done some good buddy movies. It just seems like. 
so many people, if you love their work, you're going to find a cool buddy movie on their resume. Somewhere. And it helps. I mean, Skin Trade was really cool with Tony Ja and Dolph Lundgren. I don't know if I've seen that one. The only one I think I really remember with Tony Ja was Ong Back. Yeah, but this, this is way after that. And it was just kind of cool because they were doing basically, they had come up with the formula years before Taken had been a thing. And then they basically cashed in on that. And they managed to make a cool, hard hitting movie as well as just a cool, just unofficial buddy cop movie. And with a bunch I'll of. Check, I'll, I'll check stars. that out. Yeah, it's it's got a great all star cast. Peter Weller, uh, Ron Perlman, Terry Tagawa even shows up because he's in every other Dolph movie. So yeah, it's fun. <laughs> the ma- once you cast Dolph Lundgren, you have to cast him, don't you? It's just kind of like, yeah, it's happening. Yeah, yeah, everyone helps each other out, and uh, I, I feel like, like you say, is just people don't understand just the delicateness of putting a perfect buddy movie together. And if you just put some serious work, just like with your tone, you can have one hell of a blockbuster. And it seemed like now, after a while, everyone just didn't want to even do any research. It's like, screw it. Just put two famous stars. Let's not worry about the plot. And let's have a bunch of giant shootouts and explosions and have them improvise some back and forth. And it's like, usually it just does not work because it's just it's too much. I think like you see it quite a lot now. Well, uh, probably the early two thousands when Pacino and De Niro done a few more movies together. Oh uh, yeah, uh, and you're like, was it twenty two min or eighty eight minutes and stuff like that? And you're like, what the fuck is this? Uh, and those were by those same yeah. scammy producers we mentioned. So yeah, and then uh, you go back and look at their body of work when they done the likes of Heat and stuff together, and mm-hmm. you're like, how do you go from that? To 88 minutes uh, basically the markets kept changing and then it's like five years later yeah i'll take whatever you offer me and it's like well it's gonna suck but i guess you don't care about your resume right now morgan freeman and uh john cusack definitely don't and at the same time some of these actors are just so past everything they don't want to be in an oscar bait movie that's overrated and they don't want to be in a superhero movie so what can they be in that people will Joke. see right and it sucks because not Director video didn't always used to be just so laughable. I mean, they made those Billy Blanks, Roddy Piper movies for Universal, you know, home video. Yeah. It's uh, like, it doesn't have to be a so bad is good or trashy mystery science theater kind of movie. It can be a fun, legit movie. Reg- and now that streaming is basically the equivalent of cable TV slash director video, but it's, oh, we, we don't call it that. We call it streaming because it's not going to a theater. Get it? And it's like, well, so what is it? And it seems like everyone's having an identity crisis or just, again, just half-assing it. And it sucks because you like to give everything a chance. You like to think not everything has to be over the top or giant, large scale. I- I'm I'm personally tired of capes and sword fighting. I want to see actual, like, just a fun, cool, fleshed out story with some dynamite stunts and wonderful photography and actors that actually want to be there. And you're happy enough with that. Like, for me, I'll watch generally most things. Um, horror would be my big. Uh, well, that's just like horror's changing too. There's some that are experimental. Not, not for the not for the better either. No, there's a lot of shit out there uh, for horror. I I pretty much got back into it uh, post torture porn just because I just realized so much of how I. Um, I was so how, happy when that ended. Well, yeah, I, it is, I, it's mostly over, but every once in a while, there's still like another saw or found footage type shit fest. And I'm like, guys, this isn't scary. So I, but whenever there's a really original one that comes out that involves sharks or, you know, demons or a monkey's paw, I, I know you love sharks, but I, I just, I do too. And I'm just like, Hey, I'm going to see a 47 meters down type movie. I'm going to see a Wishmaster type movie. I'm going to see. Even something There's another great movie that you just mentioned there. It's a complete sleeper for people. Wishmaster. It absolutely Wishmaster is. Wishmaster by Wes Craven was fucking oh. phenomenal. I'll invite you on for another special on that. Let's talk about the best mm-hmm. moments. But yeah, I mean, you, you also kind of just, you want people to have fun with this instead of, I mean, the first two Mummy movies kind of did that where they're, they're kind oh, of yeah. horror movies. They were great. 
but they're also a sci-fi fantasy film. And I think audiences after a while, they just kind of don't know what the genres are anymore. It's like more often than not, your My average blockbuster. My hates those movies. Yeah, can't please everyone. She, hate, she hates them because her dad used to put them on. If they were on, he'd sit and watch. It didn't matter if he watched it the day before. Ah, this no. has made her tire out of it. Um, well, like, I, I, I'd be like that now. There's certain movies I'll watch and... Like I was away in the summer. We were away in Puerto Rico in <laughs> the Grand Canaries and had the two kids and they were asleep in the in, in bed and it was half eleven or something, flicking through the channels and Jaws had just started. And I was like <laughs> I was like, Well, I says, It'd be rude if I don't watch it. So I watched right. it. The next night I brought the kids back to bed and like they were having a few drinks outside in the balcony and uh flicking through the channel and Jaws was starting. There you go. And I was like I was like, fair enough. Right. Jaws it is. I guess you're going to be here <laughs> so all I, night. Um, my, wife came in, my wife came in and was like, are you watching Jaws again? And I was like, what do you mean? Am I watching it again? You should be saying, you should be watching it again. There you go. It's just good manners. But, um, and like you say, I mean, you have all these blockbusters that is like, you just can't look away from them. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen them. They have certain shots that are magnetic. They have characters that you love to quote. And, but honestly, I feel like a lot of people got out of touch with blockbusters because there's just like so many movies that are basically genre mashups. Like you can't tell me Temple of Doom isn't both a horror movie and an action adventure movie. You know, Temple Temple of Doom is terrible. Oh, hot take. It's terrible. All, all Indiana Jones are worth it, except for I'd Crystal have, Skull. Well, I'll tell you what. I'd have Crystal Skull higher than Temple of Doom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I generally don't see the love for Temple. I'm also one small few. I'd say number three is better than number one. Well, yeah, I I grew up with Last Crusade too. I I get tired of everyone shitting on that one. It's like no, you can't. It it the only thing better than a dad's movie is having a, a dad and his son get back together. <laughs> and the only thing out. that's better than that is having Sean Connery in it. Right. Yeah. No. That was phenomenal. Um, yeah, like I'm sick of seeing things. And like as you're saying there about blockbusters, every other movie that's coming out, summer blockbuster, winter blockbuster. No, it's a shite movie, lads. Let's be, let's put it call a spade a spade. You can put the word blockbuster, and it doesn't mean it's a blockbuster. It's very rare that they are coming out now. Obviously, the big one this year, the big blockbuster this year was Top Gun. Oh God, yeah, yes, it was. Did you uh, enjoy Top Gun? I can't say anything nice about it. It was a pretty soulless movie with a lot of bad CGI and ego stroking. But Tom Cruise needs something else after Mission Impossible. <laughs> Got to build a new franchise. <laughs> yep. Do it. Pretty soon, he'll be basically doing what every other actor is doing. Just start doing sequels to hit movies he was in. Another He's few good anyway. <laughs> another, another few good men. <laughs> another... Um... Another minority report. Another. And well, no, no, no one needs another one of them. That was awful as well. No, garbage. How dare you say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, another. Um, what was the one? The firm. Uh, yeah. What would it be called? Firmer. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we do need is Swastika to get back in and do a second eraser. Oh, they That's did, what we need. apparently, but it's direct to video. <laughs> yeah, they did. It's um I haven't seen it. Oh sure I've there. seen I've seen someone I've seen a pop up who it was and I seen I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. No R- wrong sauce. <laughs> it's the same it's the same. They made um you know Van Damme's movie Hard Target. Oh god, yeah. I mean they made a second one had, of them. That had Scott Atkins at least, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. It is. That's who it is, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a shame that some of these B-movie guys, they just, they were doing some theatrical stuff in B-movies, and now they're kind of just stuck in just direct video and you're like, I know they can do more. <laughs> and Michael J. White, Scott Atkins, I know you can do more. Michael J. White's a very good actor. I think uh, he, he took some bad roles. He took Spawn. Yeah, things. it's a shame. Spawn, like, got him attention, and at the same time, it really didn't do much of anything for anyone's career, so it's... It's a tough predicament. He's like the best part of Universal Soldier 2 besides the action. <laughs> Universal 2, the one with Goldberg, isn't it? Yep. 
Yeah. <laughs> so said the least said about that, the better. I mean, the least said about most of the Game of Souls, the better. I mean, I know a lot of people love them. I just find that their tone is all over the place. It's like one minute they're trying to get deep. And it's like, well, if you want to get deep, why didn't you flesh out this story more? Because now we're just asking more questions like, why are they undead soldiers who want to eat and all this other shit? Oh, <laughs> I just want to eat. It was, it was crazy. Uh, Dolph Lundgren pretty much saved the first one. He just added all this depth to this war criminal who's now an undead soldier. <laughs> uh, uh, even that, like, the, there was a lot of them bad ones, too. Oh, yeah. All of them have a lot of shit that they probably wish they didn't have on their resume, and it just sucks because they're better yeah, than they... they... <laughs> yeah, and you work with what but you I got. Mean... There's certain people like you see where they're starting and they're in B rated and then they become really big. Like take a look at Jennifer Anderson, she started in Leprechaun. Yeah. <laughs> things like that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio started in Critters Tree. Oh uh, well. And things, you know. DiCaprio's still like, being trash. <laughs> uh the Revenant was trash, yeah. Yeah. Um I wouldn't say he's doing much though. The Revenant I didn't enjoy. Shouldn't have won an Oscar for it. Oh hell no! Um, it's like he that's not even. He should have won the Oscar thing. for. He should have won the Oscar for um, Wolf of Wall Street. Eh, that was just a Wall Street knockoffs, <laughs> even though it was a real life thing. I, I think my deal is every movie wants to be free hours, and every filmmaker I grew up loving, after a while, I just kind of lose interest in them because I just know they're not really just going to bring anything new to the table which sucks because they're often renowned for being groundbreaking and riveting there's only so many times you can go to the well though you know what i mean before totally. something has been done well and that's how it was with the irishman i'm like i don't want to see all these cgi you know oh uh, the irishman was atrocious it's like and not making use of any of its time and i see all these other guys who are all particular about that sort of thing and they are just fascinated i'm like by what? There's literally I'm I have not learned a single thing about these assholes. I laughed maybe once at the car bombings and their revenge on that, but that's it. Like the rest of it is like seen it before. It you the know the CGI in going. that the CGI in that was so bad I had to look to make sure that your man was Al Pacino at least three times. Right? It's uh, it just wasn't very good at all. And no. Joe Pesci totally wasted and Everyone was bitching about uh, Anna Paquin, and I'm like, she didn't have anything to work with here, guys. She literally just had the most generic dialogue, so no one's going to be good when it comes down to that. Like, I mean, if that's what they're are, are moaning about, it tells you what the film was fucking atrocious. Uh, yeah, I, tell me, name me one single character. This is like, okay, so the guy who's testifying against Robert F. Kennedy, what what does he have to do with the story? And Harvey Keitel's character apparently was way more violent in real life. And instead, they just play it safe. They're like, let's have him just say a few nasty lines of dialogue. I'm like, well, but he can do that in his sleep. He's already done that in Mean Streets and Reservoir Dogs. And I, I just, I I gave up. I started watching it one night, turned it off, turned it back on the next night done another hour and i was like i was like oh no and then the tour I night i eventually I actually went finish. back the tour night i went back and i actually watched it from start to finish oh god and i was like i was sitting there going why greg why did you do oh, this to yourself it, it, it does happen and scorsese he's he's getting up there i i was the same way with spielberg's west side story i saw it on an airplane ride and i'm like okay clearly you really love the original movie a lot. You have a talented cast. It's cool that you snuck in Rita Marino there, but it still just feels like a homage. It doesn't feel like much of a movie. It just feels like a love letter, but not a complete love letter. It just feels like, hey. I didn't I didn't watch it. Yeah, I didn't get anything from it. And it's a shame because I really grew up loving the original musical, and I was just like, okay, well, you really never, love this. Never seen the original either. Oh, well, the original is a gem, but it was just one of those where you're just like, okay, clearly you wanted to do this, and you got a pretty much mostly pretty kick-ass resume, but, I mean, there's a reason you lost money over this. It just kind of, you kind of didn't really bring anything new to this remake. You just kind of just did whatever, 
it, it just wasn't anything to write home about, really. And it's a shame because you expect more had, the bigger the name. I, I had heard that now, mind you, but again, I, I wouldn't be. There's a few musicals I've seen that I like. There's not many. Um, Pink Floyd's The Wall. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I didn't even know that was a movie. <laughs> okay, yeah, Tenacious D in the Pick of Dust. That is one. Yes. What it's would a, you terrible, make? Terrible movie. But... Ah, how dare you hate the D? Anyway, I think the weapon should be a musical. That'd be pretty funny. I mean, pow, it can't be pow, any pow, bad. Pow. It can't be as bad. Can't be as bad as four. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Should look. What can we do? They can make. We, they we're... can make Die Hard a musical. I'd watch it. Absolutely. As long as you get Alan Rickman back from the dead to do it. Ah, oh, well. I mean. Or just use the, use the voice that he has. Get a recording of it. So when he walks in off the elevator, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> genius, genius. A thousand percent. Yeah, I think Lethal Weapon will just it'll be left alone for now. Jill Silver has unfortunately had to step outside of Hollywood just because he just doesn't get along with the new rules and new producers and the various other new mindsets. He's been focusing instead on his mansions and art collection and producing from afar. Um and I, mean, I think that's that, not, he's not short of money. <laughs> He's, no, and I think he prefers it that way. He'd rather give an interview about his giant, extensive career. Uh, but I think that TV show on Fox, the reboot of Lethal Weapon, I think that left a bad taste in everyone's mouth for a while. It's like, because I, 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 when we were prepping, you were like, I didn't even know there was a show. I'm like, yeah, well, you, you didn't miss out. I watched nope. it. It was okay. And then after a while, it was pretty much one of those where the behind the scenes melodrama really made people tune out. And then they, it was so bad. Like, so basically Dan Wayans was there and they basically re- make him Murtog. He's in, he's basically in last boy scout mode and they just change it to where he's a gun nut from Houston and Clayton Clawford. who was like a go-to for playing bad guys was playing rigs and they made him like ex special ops and everything. And they had kind of a go-to of, who's who of bad guys who you've seen in movies and TV forever, you know, be the villain of the week. But after a while, it just kind of got old. And then it was so bad. Like Fluffer was like, so method acting and pissing everybody off. He even like slapped Lance Henriksen by accident, like on film. He was playing the bad guy that week. And Henriksen is like, so- I am not working hard enough to be treated this bit way. And they replaced him with Sean William Scott, and then they wrote in a lame thing, like, I'm Riggs, I had, I'm on the run from the mafia, and I had to surgically, you know, reshape my face, I'm like, now you're just trying too hard. <laughs> Is that, so it's a new episode every week, kind of new story every week? Yeah, it was on for, like, three years, and they just tried way too much, and I saw some people who surprisingly loved it, I'm like, I, I can't believe you guys, that you're not watching the same thing I'm watching, there's nothing clever to this. I dug the training day show because that at least followed the movie and gave some background and had some of the returning supporting villains on there. But I mean, there's other worlds, which you just can't revisit. Like you can re you can try, but you're just going to get unfair comparisons and they're just piggybacking. They're piggybacking there. And it's kind of like when you have a friend who you find out last minute is doing some brand ambassador stuff to your family members at a party. He's like, wow. You're hustling me. <laughs> You're hustling <laughs> everyone I know. That's not cool. You got you got to respect the hustle. I can respect a hustle when it's done well, and that's the thing. Half the time I would encounter someone like that, and they weren't a very good salesman either. So it was just like, okay, so am I the asshole for just turning you down, or do I just have to say <laughs> to your face, you suck at selling? Like, sell me this pen. I know no. you know for a fact that this product sucks. So stop trying to convince me. You you won't regret it. I regret being your friend. Well, I am. And I think that's just it. The mismatched... Mic drop. <laughs> mic drop, yeah. And, I mean, that's also just something they can't uh, replicate from the original first two Lethal Weapons because it's like they had the mismatched pair down to a T. I mean, don't get me wrong. I get that from Die Hard 3, too, with Sam Jackson as Zeus and 
McLean, yeah. but I mean, there's just so many. And 48 Hours, I think, did it the most well because you know that was by the diehard writer Stephen D'Souza, and you just kind of need that now. You need the mismatched personas, and you need the dialogue to ignite. And everyone wants to just be Tarantino, where you know where they're just fucking around, and it's just like you want actual like layers to everything like an onion you know like they say in shrek <laughs> well i mean i mean tarantino is probably the the best director in hollywood yeah and it also just depends on what kind of style you prefer do you prefer his alternate uh history take or do you prefer his crime comedies it is like tarantino oh, is de- always going to be a powerhouse so i mean def- definitely I'd, I'd be more along the lines of the the crime comedy the pulp fiction kind of setup Oh, totally. Um, Reservoir Dogs. Um, so many movies even, try to replicate yeah. those nowadays, and it sucks because you're just like, yeah. yeah, but you're going on too long, and it doesn't feel calculated. Or, and because, you know, Tarantino is a blender of cinema, you know? <laughs> and yeah, he, it seems he kinda, like... He, he's, a, he's an enigma of his own. Um, totally. Like, on a, on our show on Retro Heaven Recast, our co-host, Carl Sherlock, he actually done a thesis on Tarantino being a genre of his own for college. Oh wow! And I, I'd fully agree with him too that like he he doesn't have a genre that it fits into because it's got everything in it. I know. I see so many try to put it in just one genre. It's like you can't. It, he's got horror elements. He's got crime elements. He's got action elements. He's got even mystery and dark comedy elements. Like, like, even if you look at Pulp Fiction, it's got science fiction in it because apparently in the briefcase. It's Marcellus Wallace's soul. I've heard that uh, theory, yeah. and it might as well be because it doesn't fit in any other part of the movie. So you might as well call it science fiction or fantasy. Yeah. I mean, I mean like, pulp it's, it's fiction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pulp Brilliant fantasy. though. Thousand percent. And like you say, I mean, everyone's just kind of getting to that point. We're just getting burnt out. And we're just seeing our icons just embarrass themselves and. Uh, these na- these twenty year old movies are now about to be thirty five to forty years old, and they're still kicking. They're still party movies. They're still beloved. Yeah, and there's people, a reason because they were so well done. People would rather go see an anniversary screening of Jaws or Dawn of the Dead versus whatever just came out this week that went and died at the box office. You know, <laughs> fall. <laughs> Uh, I heard good things about fall and what's the other thing? I mean, like, like how how good can it be? Two people standing on a ledge for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? Oh, you know, it's it's got some pretty decent reviews. It's mainly it's, it's kind of like buried. You know what I mean? I didn't watch that. Okay, phone. <laughs> Those kind of movies annoy me. Phone booth uh, was me. Yeah, I know. I know what you're. I know what you're getting room. at. Like hundred twenty-seven hours movies. that. Forty-seven yeah. meters down. <laughs> Absolutely, seen that. Took me four years to see it, but I've seen it. <laughs> I don't mind it if it's done well. I hate it when, like you say, it just feels like a snuff film as opposed to a very ingenious work of art where they're being very clever. And, uh, you know, there's other movies, you know, not everyone can always be on the same page. I mean, I, li- I like some of A24 stuff and I hate some of their other movies, you know, and it's just like it's all a matter of me. That's that's me all over. I can't stand Hereditary or my, um, Midsummer. Oh yeah, Midsummer is bad, and I see a lot of people trying to defend one versus the other. It's like Hereditary at least started out okay, and then it went downhill. And it's like uh, it comes at night. It's pretty good. I think you'd like. Didn't, didn't I seen that once? It was like me. Um, the Witch. I really hated the first time, but it, after a second watch, I was like, yeah, brilliant. I'll try um, and rewatch it. I am so bored by it. <laughs> yeah, I was as well the first time. I was so out of the movie, like people were knocking to the door and stuff. But I actually went and watched it at night one night and I turned my phone off, but I didn't turn it off. I put it over the other side of the room and I sat and watched it. <laughs> and it was so much better. Um, X was phenomenal this year. Um, looking forward to seeing Pearl now when it, when it actually does get released over here. Um... There was there's a few like they they were banging out great movies for a while. Uh, the Lighthouse and things uh, like I that. I didn't like the light, Lighthouse, but I understand it. Everyone likes the yeah. uh, again claustrophobic nature of it and it trying to be like a 40s movie. <laughs> yeah, 
it's a strange one, but like it is, it is what it is. I like them trying to be original. Uh, all I can say is Pattinson is not an actor. <laughs> Rob Patterson? Yeah, he's not an actor. <laughs> I know a few people that will disagree. Um, I That's I all good. I've seen most of his I resume. <laughs> it's pretty bad. I did not enjoy the new Batman. Well, even before that, I can name you a few just off the top of my head. High Life. And, uh, Twilight. Twilight 2. Twilight 3. Right. Twilight 4. A good time was pretty pointless. It's like, okay, I've seen That's just... the Twin Towers movie, is it? No, no, it's the where the ex-con going straight, post-robbery, and just... But yeah, he wasn't oh, a right. twin... He was in a movie where, yeah, it's like Remember Me, where he's like he's dying at the realm of the Twin Towers. Uh, he he's really distracting in Tenet, where you're just like, please shut up. I want to follow Denzel Washington's son around. <laughs> I like John David Washington. He's a good actor. Yeah, he he's gonna go places. And yeah. Queen of the Desert was pretty pointless. Uh, there's all kinds of movies of his that he's either just out of place in or just annoying in I, I know the rover a lot of people like and i, I couldn't stand that or cosmopolis <laughs> dude the um yeah it's it's tough like we have to, we tend to watch quite a lot of movies with recast because obviously when we're recasting a new movie well not a new movie but like on the show when we have a, a battle for whatever movie like um this week coming out now we've done la confidential oh wow yeah there's a buddy um, movie so- <laughs> how shotgun. do you how do you recast Guy Pierce? You know what I mean? Well, and isn't it being a TV show? So I mean, it's a different adaptation technically. So I mean, it may be even more like James Elroy's novel, if anything. But no, like we recast it as a as a battle. Like so, the three boys would have picked a person each, and I'd pick who I think is the best person for the role. But like you were naming out so many names, you kind of have had to see quite a lot of movies to to pick how the actor is, you know, that kind of way. Mm-hmm. So I tend to see a lot of a lot of actors do different random things and Rob Patterson's one that I just can't seem to to buy Replicate. into. Replicate, yeah. Well, that's just it. The gimmick is pretty much everything now. And I do, I do commend him for, I know he tries to get away from the Twilight name. Um, because that's the, he's going to be tired with that forever, mm-hmm. uh, even with the Batman. But like he couldn't have turned that down. People are like you shouldn't have done it. Why shouldn't you have done it? Do you know what I mean it's going to be a blockbuster? Why wouldn't you fucking do it? It's a bit of everything. It's just like we're having to learn the hard way that quality is just not a thing. It will make tons of money. I mean, we've talked about Saw earlier. There's all kinds of other. I mean, they're going to make Fast and Furious probably till the number no, thirty. Ne- ne- I think the next one's the last one, isn't it? Until it makes more money, you know, they're all going to make crazy amounts of money. So I'm, I guarantee well, you, I mean, it'll make the last it a one. Number three. The last one where they were driving the car in space, I was like, "What the fuck is going on here?" I'm glad I don't remember that. I just was like, "Man, tuning out." This is. So what? One, two. Uh, didn't like three. Four was good, and then it just became ridiculous. <laughs> I'm glad someone got from him. I would always just like watch them and I'm like zoning out. This is not a movie. This is car porn. Uh, I remember, I remember, I remember loving one and two growing up. Yeah. And they were pretty much trying to be like point break and Beverly Hills Cop. It's like, yo, man, yo, yo, yo. Yeah. <laughs> True. Race cars. Fam- it's family. Family. <laughs> so I guess that means they're Thanksgiving movies. Family. Yeah, well, they're always sitting around the table. <laughs> there you go. Sure. So, so where can we, my dude, G-Man, find you on the interwebs? You can find us on Instagram at Retro Attainment Recast. Um, you can find us on YouTube under the Retro Attainment Recast show, or I'll send you the links and you can throw them in the, in the bio. And then my other horror show is called On the Slab. You'll find us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter at On This Lab Horror. Excellent. Um, Excellent. For all your horror needs. All your horror needs. Including the trailer that we or trailer review for Halloween that we put up today. Uh, there you go. Review and a new show every Friday night. Every Friday. There you go. 
Peace and love. Absolutely. <laughs> Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a Jack Dove Review Show.